Cool. Well, welcome, Wyoming. Um, it's such an honor to get to do this with all of you. Uh, I'm, I don't live in Wyoming, but my husband's from there. He actually grew up part of his uh, high school days in KC. And I've been from Colorado most of my adult life, really next door. Um, uh, and it's kind of strange. I now live in Indiana, which is really strange for me too. But um, I got this grant years ago, even before COVID. And as some of you know, we paused. We didn't even start right away. Uh, and, and, and things are tough out there. I, uh, I, I, that is not a platitude, guys. I was on the call yesterday with, um, with your, uh, many of you met with Senator Barrasso. And my heart is heavy for all that you're going through. So just know that. And uh, some people have told me they, they don't have the bandwidth to take in these, these trainings. I totally get that. Um, and therefore, I want to thank you all who, who are on the webinar today. Uh, hopefully, you know, just continue to learn, um, meet your needs also during these tough times. And, um, you know, what I've learned about the culture change movement, any ideas for changing institutional culture end up helping, period. They help retain staff, they help recruit, they help draw people to wanna to live there, satisfaction, quality of life, things are better. So uh, again, thanks for joining me and thanks to your Wyoming State Survey Agency for uh, um, approving this grant. It's actually called Implementing Culture Change Throughout Wyoming affecting resident-directed living and team member retention. And notice the langu language there, everyone. I love just teaching new language, resident-directed living. How do you like that? Um, believe it or not, when, when uh, CMS put forth the new requirements of participation back in 2016, if you recall, person-centered care, person-centered care planning was a big deal. And you know, that's fine and good, but guess what? It's so sad to me. The minute they published all that, they were behind our movement. We had already moved on to resident directed or person directed because it's stronger. And can a person direct their life even living with dementia? Yes. Can they be asked questions? Can they be asked yes or no? Can they be given a choice? You know. And so I'd love to invite you into that language if you like it, if you want to perpetuate it, it's stronger. And notice the word care is not there. Personally, I feel like saying, shouldn't good care be a given? <laughs> shouldn't it? Like, you know, just saying. And, and sadly, in this world uh, we, we work in, um, it, it tends to all be about care, right? Person-centered care, the care plan, long-term care, medical care, clinical care. And then, you know, with the whole pandemic, we, went, we really went heavy again, right? On medical care. And so I just want to invite you again, changing language is not that hard and it costs no money. And you personally could just decide to do it right now. And so what I have loved learning is to focus more on the life that the people are living who live where you work. They live there, they eat there, they sleep there. And, and it's one simple thing we all can do is just get the focus back on the living more than only on the care. And then I wanna thank you for joining me on the subject. Um, it, it has come up here and there. Some of you might have been with us last March. We had an online culture change conference and we had a Dynamo teacher from Canada, Suzanne Queering, talk about um, you know person-directed dining. And she brought up the dining practice standards and they've come up here and there. And some of you that I work with brought up that um, we really, need to have some education on liberalizing diets. So, so I'm gonna start telling you about the dining practice standards. And we're just going to move into one section of um, about 10 sections. And uh, that is diet liberalization. And then next month, we'll move into the next uh, section of these standards. And I love these standards, so I'm really glad <clears throat> that you all were interested in learning more about them. And this is kind of a neat story that drives uh, the, the, these standards. <laughs> Look at this. Someone who got to be 105 says bacon is the key to her longevity. A 105-year-old Texas woman who worked a life of physical labor. She had seven kids. 
people ask her all the time, what's your secret to longevity? And she says, bacon. <laughs> she says, I love bacon. I eat it every day. Uh, and when people ask, what's the secret to living? She says, bacon. She says, I don't feel as old as I am. That's all I can say. Isn't that great? Um, so, oh my gosh, look at this. She dances at 105. Her birthday party was a three-day affair with more than 200 guests. Wow. So that, to be honest, everyone, that's kind of what drove us uh, to develop these standards. Um, how can we all get better at helping people eat what they want to eat at these older ages? Who are we to say to a 105-year-old, you can't have your bacon, right? That is what drove us. Now, I also have to tell you a little history here. I've been very blessed to be a part of a lot of big projects. And back in, first of all, um, 2008, uh, CMS and the Pioneer Network, that's our culture change uh, lead organization, did a big national symposium. We called it Creating Home. And the first one was on the environment, a national symposium on culture change and the environment. Well. I can tell you more about that one sometime, but what that really led to was doing a second one. And uh, actually here, wait, I have some of it here, sorry. Out of that first symposium, the big thing that came out of it was that we got the attention of the NFPA, that's the National Fire Protection Association, and they actually made four big changes to their life safety code. Many of you don't know this. And all of that is within the, the code book of 2012, um, big changes. And if you wanna know more about that, let me know, that could be a webinar, okay? Uh, we also got some good changes uh, regarding quality of life into the CMS guidance. And here we go, out of that first symposium, it just became more and more evident that we have got to help professionals, help people living in nursing homes, eat what they wanna eat. And we realized we have to do another symposium. So then in um, 2010, we did another Creating Home National Symposium, number two, a national symposium on culture change and the food and dining requirements. Now, these symposiums ran much like a congressional hearing. We invited uh, speakers to just speak about these issues. How does culture change look uh, compared to CMS regs or um, food code. We, we had someone come from the CDC, uh, you know, and we just all tried to think proactively and share what we've learned and share ideas on what can change. They were so powerful. They were not forums to ask questions. We said no questions. We only want ideas. And I, I again, was so blessed to be the facilitator to write a big background paper to set the stage and also then I got to type up what everybody said. It was remarkable. So then what came out of that? We realized we needed new standards of practice. So thanks to a big grant by the Rothschild Foundation, we put together a big task force. I got to be the facilitator. It was so cool. I've learned so much. And these standards are free. They're at the Pioneer Network website. I actually just saw them. I double checked. I highly recommend you go get your own copy. Now. Uh, it's like 66 pages, so, you know, <laughs> it's easier to print off than the uh, regulation, but you could either have it on a laptop or print it, and maybe if you don't have part of your team with you today, make a copy for the folks who lead, you know, food service and your dietitian. So now, what does that mean that we created new standards of practice? Well, on this task force, we invited kind of all the right groups. And then because they helped develop the standards, it was pretty easy to get them to officially um, endorse them. So let me show you this uh, interesting good list. The American Association for Long-Term Care Nursing. There's a lot of um, nursing groups in here. Uh, and the Association of Nurse Assessment Coordinators, ANAC. I'm sorry. It was the ADA, but now it's the Academy for um, Nutrition and Food. Wait, help me. Dietetics, right? A-N-D. Um, I'm sorry to get that change. And then, um, welcome, everybody. <laughs> Just checking uh, the meeting situation here, guys. 
look at this. We have the American Medical Directors Association, AMDA. We have the OT Association. We have the Society of Consultant Pharmacists. We had the speech pathologists, the speech therapists, uh, the Dietary Managers Association. I'm so sorry <laughs> that title has changed too. I haven't, I haven't taught on this for a while. I need to update that. Gerontological Advanced Practice Nurse Association, Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing, the Donna is the DON Association, and last but not least, <laughs> the National Gerontological Nursing Association. So just ponder this, everyone. These big groups helped develop these standards, and they said we agree with them. Uh, that is a big deal for these standards, and hopefully it'll help you too. Now, the sections on the standards, we're only going to go into diet liberalization today. Uh, we will touch on the three big ones, diabetic, low sodium, and cardiac. Next time, we'll go into altered consistency diet. We have a lot of great things to share with you there. Um, I won't do much on tube feeding because, you know, it seems like as a nation, we all kind of feel the same about tube feeding and doesn't need a lot of attention anymore. But then the next section I'm going to do with altered consistency called Real Food First. It's my favorite. Then we'll move into honoring choice and check this out. Shifting traditional professional control to support self-directed living. I know that's a mouthful, but it is so worth the mouthful. Shifting our traditional professional control to instead support self-directed, person-directed, resident-directed living. We've got to get rid of this idea that we're in charge of people, right? We've got to get that out of our culture. And then similarly, we'll look at another section called new negative outcomes. Like what is the negative outcome that's happening when we don't help people eat what they want to eat? Okay, then if you dive into these, they're very rich, honestly, because each section we found support from AMDA, the medical directors, from the dietitians, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, from CMS Reg, from research. And then we went even more where we shared current thinking that came out of the symposium, even though it might not be in research or something yet. And then we also created new recommended course of practice for each section. And if you're interested, the Mayo Clinic has a document, it's six pages called, um, it's some proceedings they did on ethical dilemmas that I find it very helpful if that might help you all. Um, and so I'm gonna try over the next few webinars to bring to life the, this document and it's, it's pretty fun. So diet liberalization, here we go. Um, forgive me, I, I do have quotes. I try not to read every word, but um, I, I feel good about always sharing research with you, the full quote with you, the full regulation with you. Um, if any of you want to have this handout, let me know. And um, here we go. So I love starting with the doctors. Did you know, the physicians say, <laughs> one of the frequent causes of weight loss in long-term care setting is therapeutic diet. <laughs> Did you know that the physicians know that. Isn't that great? Therapeutic diets, why, are often unpalatable. Yes, they are. And poorly tolerated. Yes, they are. By older persons, I would say by younger too. And may, yep, lead to weight loss. Isn't that strong? The use of therapeutic diets, including low salt, low fat, sugar restricted, should be therefore minimized in the long-term care setting. Whoa. Did you know that? Do your doctors know that? Do all your nurses know that? Isn't that good? Attending physicians are encouraged then to consider liberalizing these dietary restrictions that are not essential to well being. Wow. And that may impair quality of life mm -hmm. or accepting the food at all. Wow. <laughs> this is just the physicians making a national statement on how they view this. I, I'm going to share some research too. So there's, it's really rich here. The Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. I'm very impressed with the Academy because it tends to, um, it tends to issue uh, papers, white papers, pretty frequently on, on, the, on these very <clears throat> thoughts about uh, being more 
what's the word, you know, supportive of older people to eat what they want to eat. Isn't that great? Dietitians are helping us. Doctors are helping us. So on one of their last papers, they wrote, it's our position that quality of life and nutritional status for older people may be enhanced by, drum roll, liberalization of the diet prescription. Medical nutrition therapy must balance, that's a good word, medical needs and individual desires and maintain quality of life. Um, look at that, everyone. Uh, another ask for me to you is to talk more about quality of life. We're not talking about it very much. You know, if you think about the quality of life regulations, who's tending to them? <laughs> Who reads them? You know, think about it. We have activity regs that go to the activity director. Social service regs go to social services. Dining, dietary, food, food and nutrition goes to most of you listening, right? And then nursing goes to nursing. Where does the quality of life regs go? To be honest, I think that has hurt us. And I, I just love thinking about these things. What if CMS had said there shall be uh, a quality of life coordinator? It's, it's a little bit of an institutional uh, Band-Aid maybe, but what if? I think things would have been different. By the way, we're trying to uh, move away from the word director. Um, and a lot of culture change homes tend to go to coordinator or softer words like that. And um, if this goes on to say the recent paradigm shift, that's the culture change movement from restrictive institutions to vibrant communities require dietetics professionals to be open-minded when assessing risks versus benefits of these therapeutic diets, especially for frail older adults. Isn't that good? So that's dietitians now talking to dietitians and it gets even better. Although these therapeutic diets are designed to improve health, isn't that ironic? They can neg very negatively affect variety and flavor of the food. Individuals may find um, these restrictive diets unpalatable, there it is again, resulting in reducing pleasure of eating. Oh, how sad. Oh, my husband just had COVID and lost his smell and his taste, everyone. He is depressed about that. Decreased food intake, unintended weight loss, and undernutrition. Wow. And look at this. The very maladies healthcare practitioners are trying to prevent. The very things we're trying to prevent we are actually pausing. That is profound, don't you think? So now we're gonna walk into the different diets, the diabetic or calorie controlled diet. AMDA, the medical directors make this statement. Intensive treatment for diabetes may not be appropriate for all those living in long-term care. They could have said for older adults, right? It tends to be the older body, everyone, that doesn't really react. You'll see that in some more coming up. Um, if you have younger people living where you work, you know, affecting the diet may have more effect on their blood sugars and their blood pressure. So notice in the long-term care setting, older people. To improve quality of life, diagnostic and therapeutic decisions should take into account cognitive and functional status, severity of disease, expressed preferences and life expectancy. Hopefully you're taking all that into account. If not, let that be a guide. An individualized regular diet that is well balanced with a variety of foods, consistent carbohydrates has been shown to actually be what? More effective than the typical treatment for diabetes. Wow. So hopefully we're all talking the same language here. Consistent carbohydrates comes into play for diabetes, people with diabetes. Oh, by the way, diabetic is a label. It's kind of common. It flows off the tongue for all of us, but it's actually a label. One thing we've learned in the study of language is to beware of all labels. So when we say she's a hoarder, label, a frequent follower, label, diabetic, label. And there's a fun teacher on this who says, you know, when you pick up glasses, do you say, oh, I'm myopic. Isn't that funny? I'm myopic. <laughs> uh, 
No, we don't. We just say, oh, I need my glasses. And I love that as an example. Just try to get to normal language explaining what's happening without all the labeling. So the person who has diabetes, when it comes to sliding scale, the only benefit to sliding scale insulin is usually with a new diagnosis and a clinician's trying to estimate what the daily dosage should be. For this reason, sliding scale should be used sparingly, if at all. I'd love to know from any of you, do you even see sliding scale much anymore? I don't know. And glucose monitoring should be done no more than once daily in someone who's stable. They shouldn't have to be picked so much if they're stable. Um, so can someone just answer that question for me? Do you see sliding scale much anymore in your state? Yes, I actually. I started to hear someone. Go ahead. Yeah, we actually have about four people here at Sublet Center on sliding scale who are still the old school finger pricks three times a day. Okay. So I was actually really interested in where that data from that slide is located, or is there a physician um, education piece or pamphlet that I can send to my doctors? Because yes. I completely agree with you. 98 year old yes. people should not be pricked three times yes. a day, yes. but we are yes. doing it here. Yes. Is that Amber? No, this is Dawn, sorry, at Sublet Center. Oh, yes. Hi, Dawn. Okay. Um, okay, guys. Uh, I mentioned that these standards are free and they're at the Piner Network website. So while I'm talking, okay. if, if you want, go to Piner Network um, and they have some different resource libraries that can, it's not really, like it's not a store, okay? It says it's free uh, resource library. And then there's a button for dining, all things dining, and then you'll find it in there. So go get the free uh, standards. And then might as well just tell you all, because it's exciting. You can also purchase what is called uh, the dining standards toolkit. If you can see me, I'm holding it up. There is a charge because it gives Piner Network, you know, support. Um, and there are things like a sample uh, letter to a physician about um, this very issue of, yeah, of um, all these diets tend to be poorly tolerated. And it quotes the Medical Directors Association because that tends to help doctors hear from other doctors. Um, and if any of you need help finding any of that, let me know, okay? The Piner Network is going under a chain where they've merged with the Greenhouse Project. So in, you know, in case something doesn't go right there, let me know, okay, and I'll help. So, um, by the way, on this slide, everyone, notice that was said at the Creating Home Symposium by two physicians that spoke. So you actually have right there, and the year is a few slides back, that was in 2010. And um, if you need more, more tighter data. Okay, thank you very much, Don. Now, here comes some research trend on diabetic diet. Recent studies have failed to show that the tight glycemic control prevents heart attacks or strokes. <laughs> and they use the label right there. I'll have to change that, sorry. In people with diabetes and actually can worsen the outcome. So tighter glycemic control may prevent complications of some things like retinopathy, neuropathy, and the nephropathy in newly diagnosed people with diabetes. However, these tend to take years to develop and few if any older adults tend to benefit from this approach. Once again, it's kind of easy to go with the older people. <laughs> it kind of makes sense. I'm, I'm not a dietitian guys, but I've just learned so much. It makes sense in my head that the older body that has changed a lot, the metabolism is different. You know, we've heard like they don't assimilate the vitamins, right? And knowing this and talking about it and learning more and coming at it as a team, you can drop some, I hate swallowing pills. Anybody else? I honestly hate it. And it causes me stress. So to take, you know, to alleviate people some of this, let alone getting pricked several times a day. Isn't that wonderful? Okay. 
more research given the lack of clear evidence to guide treatment with older people. AMDA recommends, of course, individualizing a treatment plan based on this person's uh, medical condition, their comorbidities, and um, here comes a target hemoglobin A1C should be between seven and eight. That is considered reasonable for the older person. And then we, we summarize this first little section on diabetic diet with this recommended course of practice or this recommended standard of practice. So the diabetic diets are not shown to be effective in the older adults, the long-term care population of elders for reducing the blood glucose and therefore should only be used when benefit to the individual has been documented. Isn't that good? So we're gonna flip. I love this idea of flipping. We have to prove they need this tight diet somehow. It is, we know it's helping them. I love that. It makes sense, doesn't it? Common sense. We only use these diets if we know they truly help someone. That's how a medication is supposed to go, right? Meds are great when they help someone. So there goes diabetic uh, diet. Before I move on, does anyone have anything to add to that? I got dietitians on the line or any questions? Okay, we can do that again at the end too, okay? So now let's go to low sodium. AMDA, American Medical Directors Association says that you know, some of these dietary restrictions may benefit some, but more lenient blood pressure and blood sugar goals in the frail elderly may be desirable, while a less palatable restricted diet may lead to the weight loss and its associated complications. So low sodium, lenient blood pressure, blood sugar goals. Research, the typical two gram sodium diet that's often recommended for hypertension has been shown to reduce the systolic blood pressure on average by only, oh boy, five millimeters of hemoglobin. Is that right? Ooh, it's been a while since I've taught this. If I said that wrong, someone correct me. And the diastolic blood pressure by only 2.5. <laughs> Therefore, making this diet effect on blood pressure, look at this, modest at best, and not actually shown to improve cardiovascular outcomes in the older adults. So that is not much movement is my understanding on blood pressure. Millimeters of mercury, thank you. Yep, isn't that something? So take that in everyone, research again, older person, older body doesn't do much. So why do we create all these restrictions? So that one, we're already through that one. Here, it's the same recommendation. Low sodium diets are not shown to be that effective in the long-term care population of elders for reducing the blood pressure or exacerbations of chronic heart failure. Therefore, it should only be used when you have benefit shown that it should be used because it's well-documented that it helps them. Isn't that good? All right. Any comments on low sodium? <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll take a drink. Anybody have more to add? Other research, experience, questions? Thank you guys for helping me there. Okay, next is um, cardia cardiac diet. Here we go with that one. Limiting the salt intake for people with a congestive heart failure is felt to be a benefit by limiting fluid retention. But look at the but. Clinical experience of these two medical directors of lots of nursing homes, the same two doctors that spoke at our um, symposium, shows this is necessary only in a minority of nursing home, I would say people who live in the nursing home usually those who are salt sensitive and often have advanced disease. So it's usually not very many where the salt restriction actually, again, helps them. Salt sensitive, that's something to think about, advanced disease. 
I like salt. Anybody else? <laughs> I like it a lot. That might come up again. And then here's the research effects of, of that traditional low cholesterol, low fat diet. Look at this. Lipids are decreased by only 10 to 15%. And these doctors are still talking. If aggressive lipid reduction is appropriate, it, it is more effectively achieved through medication that provides reductions between 30 and 40% rather than the diet allowing the individual to enjoy personal food choices. Woo. Isn't that good? This is why I teach this stuff. And same basic recommendation, the low fat, low cholesterol diets have only a modest effect on actually reducing the blood cholesterol in the older adult. Therefore, use only when benefit is well established. And maybe more people can have a patty melt. <laughs> I love patty melts. Anybody else? And I love showing this because this particular nursing home in Colorado ended up calling their dining room, ready? A restaurant in a nursing home. That's what they would call it. Isn't that great? And, and we have a restaurant here in the nursing home, the restaurant in the nursing home. <laughs> I think that's so creative. Okay. That's everything on the standards. Does anyone have questions? Because now I'm just gonna show you some backup from the regulations. Any thoughts or questions on any of those standards? I have, I have more time today to talk if, if anybody wants to. <clears throat> okay. I wanna show you something regarding language here. CMS um, is talking in the first bullet uh, it's like their executive summary or something about the new regs in 2016. And they said that um, they, they redesignated what used to be called dietary services to now be food and nutrition services. So I love pointing, um, oh, and they say revise introductory language to include taking resident preferences into consideration. So they made a big language change. The whole section used to be called dietary services and they changed it to food and nutrition services. That's a big language plus, if you ask me. So if your team still uses dietary, it's just a, a something you could think about, talk about. It's really an old word now. It's really not used like in a culture changing home, you know, the new greenhouses, <laughs> they're not using dietary. Uh, so, you could you could move over to um, dining services. That's kind of my what I tend to talk say. I sometimes just refer to the kitchen. That's more normal home language. And then I've also seen culinary services for those who truly go that direction. Maybe have a, a chef. So that's kind of fun to think and talk about too. And then here comes um, at at this reg. Uh, food and nutrition services, it says that your home, notice I avoid that word that starts with an F, <laughs> simply because it doesn't really reflect home. Home is the, the goal. So your home, your nursing home must provide each resident with a nourishing, palatable, well-balanced diet that meets their daily nutritional and special dietary needs, taking into consideration the preferences of each person. The reg didn't used to say that. The word preferences is now in the regs like 207 times. I believe I've done the word search more than once now. <laughs> 207 times. Pass that on to your team. Personally, I recommend that you start care planning preferences more than problems. You know, the old institutional way was problems. Everything is a problem. Uh, it actually comes from nursing school. No offense, nurses, but you know, what nurses deal with are medical problems for which there was a goal. And by the way, we try to say approaches rather than that harsh word interventions, right? And sadly, that model of care planning got adopted over in nursing homes and it's not required. You do not have to use that medical language. So it's something I've learned, try to, try to move away from problems and move toward preferences. And as you learn preferences, you know, identify them, care plan with someone, what they are, give them that choice. 
of what they prefer, right? Life will go better for them and bonus for you too, <laughs> right? So if you want to look it up, you can check me preferences 207 times. Now, uh, there's some good things I want to show you at tag 692, assisted nutrition and hydration. So here we go. Forgive me. Based on that comprehensive assessment, you must ensure a person maintains acceptable parameters of nutritional status, like usual body weight, desirable body weight range, electrolyte balance, unless the resident's clinical condition demonstrates this is not possible, or check this out, resident preferences indicate otherwise. I hope you all know that's in there. If you don't, that is a gift to you to move in this direction, to lean into people's preferences and get it well established on the care plan. And hopefully you have some standards of practice now and some research and some current thinking from physicians to help, help back you. Um, then this tag goes on, this is a big deal. It says that a person is offered sufficient fluid intake for, to maintain their proper hydration and health and they are offered a therapeutic diet when there is a nutritional problem and a healthcare provider orders a therapeutic diet. I have a trivia question for all of you listening. Who remembers what it used to say? So I have it in bold for a reason. The old regs did not say is offered. Does anyone remember? It was problematic. So, a resident must be offered sufficient fluid, offered a therapeutic diet if someone thinks they need one. Here's the answer. The answer is it used to say each resident receives. And that one word was a problem for all of us because they must receive is different than to be offered. That is a big win if you didn't know. Um, so it, it speaks the language of choice and preferences that you offer things but you just do the offering and they do the accepting or declining. By the way, let me talk about that. I'm sorry it's not on the slide, but if you wanna learn about culture change, um, what's the difference when I say she refused compared to she declined? Can someone jump on or say it in the chat box? Here comes the chat. Choice. Yep, that's right, Pam. Uh, isn't it nice uh, to say the word decline? The word itself just implies someone had a choice. And then when we say refused, she refused her bath. She refused going to the activity. She refused the diet. <laughs> you know, it's nobody's fault. But notice that's a problem. That's why we have a movement to change that institutional culture. There's that feeling that she's bad, bad, bad resident. She refuses. No, 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 no. No. These are beautiful people who have preferences, right? And the more we can help you all create choices to honor their preferences, life goes better for everybody. Now this tag goes on and look what's in it. A little section called diet liberalization. So based on the resident's assessment, it could be beneficial to minimize restrictions, yay, such as therapeutic or mechanically altered diets and, and what? Provide preferred foods Ooh, before using supplementation. We'll talk more about all that next month, but notice there's a little magic right there before supplementation. What is an institutional nursing home usually known to do? slap on the supplements. I want to caution you, try not to do that. Try to give people real food, not artificial food. And find out what people love to eat. Like if you offer me a chocolate malt compared to an Ensure, I'm all about the malt. <laughs> Anybody else? Find out what people love. Smoothies, pumpkin spice lattes, right? My hubby likes ice cream shakes. I don't, but I love malt, you see? Have fun. And we'll talk I love that topic. We'll talk about that again next month. 
so preferred foods before supplementation. We call it real foods first in the standards. Then the tag goes on. However, it is your responsibility to talk with the resident, family, and representative when possible, and provide information pertaining to risks and benefits of a liberalized diet. Okay, that's not that hard, right? Work with the resident's physician, other professionals, dietary manager, nurses, speech therapist. I don't know why it doesn't say, um, it doesn't say dietitians, dietitians, you think you'd be in there? I'm sorry, I'm laughing that, that they made a big little, a big little, sorry, uh, faux pas there, didn't they? And then using the care planning process to determine the best plan for the person. Yes. And accommodate residents' needs, preferences, and goals. Everybody circle that if you if you had taken notes. Whose goals? The residents' goals. Who should be saying what their goals are for their life, you know, which might include care, right? Um, ask people what their goals are. What are your goals, Mrs. Smith, for your diabetes and keeping it in check? The goals for your weight, the goals for you getting exercise. I, I would never say, what are your goals for your activities? That, that's not normal language. I would say, what are your goals for your life? No matter how old you are, right? What are your goals on how to spend your time, how to spend your days? And just see what people say. But, but really train yourself to move towards asking people what their goals are. And I would challenge you even to do it with people with dementia. Try it. Observe them. Become great observers. Okay, here's my favorite. Here's my favorite. Ready? Someone get ready to unmute. Ready? If I spit out my green beans, what did I just tell you? in the chat. Yuck. <laughs> That's right, Michelle. So people with dementia, even if they can't use their words, they, they show you things, they tell you things, right? And those of you that have worked with them, you, you know them. It's so beautiful. Never dismiss your own observations of people and what they are telling you, maybe even without words, okay? And I just told you I love a malt, right? So help me, man. I'll take a malt if I, if my weight can handle it, I'll take a malt every day. Oh, by the way, I would say add peanut butter, you know, isn't that cool? We all have our preferences. So moving towards preferences, uh, working as a team. This is another key component, everyone. Dietitians listening or nurses listening. Something we've learned is don't do anything by yourself anymore. Okay. There's kind of two angles here. Sometimes, well, first of all, you're more powerful together as a whole team, right? Let's just say ideally all the right people are at the table to make a decision about no longer following a restricted diet. The person is there, the family's there, you know, nurse representation's there. Um, I don't know, maybe the doctor's on the line, wouldn't that be great? Dietitians there, diet, dining services lead there. So ideally all the right people are there and you talk it through what do you want to do mrs smith and how can we support that decision now, hey everybody what do you got how can we mitigate risk support their choice okay and you're stronger together right if something goes wrong god forbid and they eat and get hurt by it you see you're still stronger together it's less likely that the family would sue i hate bringing that up but they were there they heard it they agreed to it see that's key and then the flip side of this too, this other example, sometimes let's say the team makes a really strong decision all together, but someone was not there and someone on the outside comes in, swoops in and undoes it. We can't do that anymore. So try to remember not to operate by yourself. And if something goes wrong, guess what happens in the institutional culture? We point the finger at the one who made the decision. See, we don't want that either. We want to take that away from all of you um, and function as a stronger team, supporting the person. Then, wait till you see this. We're still at tag 692, um, assisted nutrition. And now we're at the end where CMS gives examples of the deficiency categorization. And I want to show you something that was a big news 
with the new reg in 2016. So here's immediate jeopardy, very level four for this tag on nutrition. Dietary restrictions or downgraded diet textures such as mechanical soft or pureed were provided by the home against the resident's expressed preferences. Whoa. And resulted in substantial and ongoing decline in food intake, which resulted in significant or severe unplanned weight loss with accompanying irreversible functional decline to the point where someone was placed on hospice. That is immediate jeopardy. And I have never seen preferences rise to the level of severity level four before. They belong there, but I, don't, I hope you knew they were there. And here it comes again. We are now at severity level three, actual harm. Here they come again. Actual harm, the failure to assess relative risks and benefits of restricting or downgrading diet and food consistency, or to accommodate a resident's choice to accept the related risk resulting in declining food and fluid intake and significant weight loss. So resident's choice, whoa. And again, the failure to accommodate documented resident food dislikes and preferences resulted in the poor food fluid intake and a decline in function. I hope you all know that. But just in case you didn't, it's powerful that preferences and choices have risen to the level, basically, of actual harm and immediate jeopardy. All right. And could I have your help, please? Could, could each of you, uh, uh, I'd, I'd love to have your name in the nursing home you represent. And also, could each of you, you don't have to do it together if you don't want to, but I need knowledge before this training and knowledge after for the grant. And then I just have a story and some announcements to share. And could I hear from anybody? Uh, questions, comments? Did you know this already or not? Is it helpful? I have time built in to be able to talk more than usual. You're not used to that, are you? And I press the button. You all should be able to unmute yourself. Can I hear from you? I'll go. Yeah. Thanks, Haley. So beforehand, I didn't really know just like the last section you went over about the severity and all of that. Okay. Um, good to, I'm good fairly, for me to know. Yeah, you're fairly new. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm fairly new. I mean, I've been in long-term care for two and a half years, but I'm still mm -hmm. learning things because oh, yeah. you new. can go over the regs and forget yep. things or whatever. Oh, so true, true. yeah, so that, that piece was helpful to me to Very see good. that. Good. Um, and Haley, it's my fault. I should have put this on there. Can you give me one to five in your knowledge before and then knowledge after from this topic today? I knew most of this stuff. So probably, probably, can I do four and a half? Of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and then we'll say like a five after. Okay, great, great. Good, Haley, good. Um, the rest of you, I'd love to hear from each of you or in the chat box, please. And then I'll share some announcements. Michelle, Sammy, don't be shy, guys. I really like that part about, like, you know, the doctors and, you know, one finger stick a day and diabetes and stuff, because we've actually had some issues with that recently and kind of had some tense conversations with that on some of our residents. So I think it's nice that, like, you finally have a source for that too. And it's like other physicians are doing this. Yeah. Um, and, like, I'm, I just graduated from my master's program in May Congrats. and then my first time job is in yeah. long-term care. So I'm very new to this. <laughs> yes, so I, yes. And like we learned about liberalizing diets and stuff in school. So I'd say before my knowledge was probably like a three and now it's uh -huh. probably like a four, four okay, and a half. Good. Wonderful. Thanks, Sammy. Nice to meet yep. you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, Sotea and your dietitian. Yeah. What do you guys think? Uh, 
Well, I'm not like, well, I say it was a three to a four, but my dietary manager, he said, like, no, we are a four. And I mean, now we are a five. <laughs> great, great. So she know majority and she does. Great, uh, great. And, but it was a great call for sure. And I do agree about the diabetes management thing for sure for quality of life. You know, I don't totally agree with that. And then I do like the terminology, the language, you know, like uh, rather than say refuse, you know, uh, mm -hmm. decline is a better word. Mm -hmm. uh and you know operate rather than just like you know what's the term you use like anyway so those are good languages for sure mm -hmm. good Wonderful. make more sense so uh -huh. thank you good hey amy holt team uh what do you mean by four to five foods i'm sorry can you guys unmute and thank you michelle for the chat box and I will move on pretty quick here, guys. Um, Pam Specker, what do you say? Okay, four to five. <laughs> it came out four to five foods instead of four to five. That's hilarious. We'll talk about fortifying foods next time. Okay, here we go. So. Well, Carmen, time. we yeah. started we started with our restaurant style dining there Yay. at the care center. Uh, it's been an eye opener for me. I remember so often uh, just seeing the plates and plates of food being thrown away. Yeah. Uh, now they all have their menus and they go through every day and they have choices that they can make and they sometimes I kind of. I cringe when I see all it is, is mashed potatoes and gravy, but you know what? They're happy, they're yep. content, and they're getting what they want. Oh, Pam, I could just dance. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> and Pam, are you also saying that the food is not as wasted? Then? Is that what you're also saying? Oh, they're saving so much. Um, yes, so much money on their food and, oh, and the wow. residents, like I say, they, they love the idea that they get, they have choice. Yep, of course, of course they do, right? Oh, thank you, Pam. Pam, just for fun, and then we'll move on. Can you share uh, before and after, please? <laughs> uh, for me, because I've gone through the training with you before, I would say it was about a four and a half beforehand, mm -hmm. and now we're at a five. Uh, I think I learned a lot just going, hearing some of those regs were, that was quite an eye opener. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And thank you. I have Lara um, from Sage Living. Thanks, Lara. I got your note. I appreciate that. And can you give some in the chat box, Laura, can you say knowledge before and after, please, one to five? Uh, a quick story, guys. My daughter was only four years old, and we went on a tour of a nursing home doing culture change in Colorado many years ago. She's now 17. And, and this is so interesting to me. Um, she heard things like Pam just said, restaurant style, open dining, sleep till you want to wake up. And... And we, we homeschooled, so it was actually like homeschool field trip. And at the end, I said, Ellie, I don't think you listened very well today. It's kind of a not a great mom moment. I, I remember being disappointed in her. And I said, what, what's one thing you learned? <laughs> and at age four, she says, ready? Everyday pancakes. She was listening. She learned. She could have pancakes every day. Just like you said, Pam. Who cares what people want, especially at that age? If they want pancakes every day or mashed potatoes and gravy every day or bacon every day, it is their life. They made it to that age. Who are we to say that they can't, right? And so um, here's some a send off to all of you for more words. Uh, instead of that F word that doesn't have anything to do with home, uh, like I mentioned, people use instead the word home, not even home like. Uh, the word community, and you can also just refer to the name of the place, whatever you are, St. John's or Sage Living. And then we're really encouraging people to avoid patient. We are each a patient to our doctor, but that's about it. You're a patient in a hospital, not when you live there and it's your home. And we're actually moving away from residents, believe it or not. And some of us just refer to the people who live there. You hear me say that a lot. Uh, person, individual, I love the word individual. And then many of your communities have decided altogether, particularly those who live there, to refer to one another as neighbors. 
And a lot of people end up doing this because they truly are neighbors down the hall or they were neighbors living in the community. Don't have to, but you could talk about it and see what y'all think. Uh, trying to move away from labels, like I mentioned, feeder, hoarder, wanderer, isolator, screamer, complainer, frequent faller, diabetic. So try to not label at all. Try to just say what you mean. That's a person who has diabetes. How do you like this? Label jars, not people. <laughs> I love that. Um, and the only label anybody needs is the one our parent has given us. Ooh, love that. Uh, instead of intervention, it's kind of a heavy medical word. A lot of places don't use it. They use approach, approaches. I love approach. It's so soft and kind and gentle. And, they, and I personally would add to that individualized approaches, individual approaches. Think about this, everyone. You're going to take a breath and you're going to say some words. And they either have no power at all or they have power. And, um, or, or I should say they have power either way to perpetuate the institutional culture or to get out of it and create a normal culture, a better culture. And then last but not least, um, you know, the idea of moving to talk more about preferences than problems. So in Wyoming, in this grant, we have two big goals and we could use your help. One goal is that every person working in a Wyoming nursing home somehow receives culture change training and we need your help. So please, I'll be sending out the recording link soon. Pass it on, invite your team. You know, the more people that hear this, the, the more your culture will be affected. Um, everyone's always welcome. If you wanted some residents or family members, they're welcome. And then also our big goal is to have, <laughs> our big goal is everyone who lives in a nursing home in Wyoming, um, sleeps until they wake up. It's called natural awakening. And some of you are working on it. Thank you, thank you. So, um, you know, we've got recorded webinars and uh, we might have a speaker on this as well. I'll tell you about that in a minute. We're also seeking homes in your state to join another portion of this project. Westward Heights is on, you guys are in the project. Um, Pam, Star Valley was in the one-year project. Uh, if your team has the bandwidth to do this, what you would sign up for is uh, using the Artifacts of Culture Change tool and then getting coaching calls once a month to implement at least three practices. And many homes do a lot more than three. One of them is individualized birthdays, by the way. <laughs> Pam has done a lovely job of that. Uh, save the date. Get this, we already have a place booked, August 11th, 2023. And we're leaning towards um, Dr. Linda Shell, who teaches on restorative sleep and, and also on, on, on leadership during crises. Um, uh, we're leaning towards her. If you have ideas of what you want as topics or a speaker, let me know. And next month, it's gonna be October 21. I don't think that, well, Friday, October 21. Sometimes it's the very last Friday, sometimes not, so beware. Um, and we're gonna keep going with the dining practice standards and we're gonna move into altered consistency diet uh, and real foods first. <laughs> and how do you like this? This is my send off, it's time to let you go. Happy weekend and my friend's mug says, hello Saturday, I love you. <laughs> so thank you all for joining me. Uh, does anyone have any last comments or questions or ideas, anybody? If not, I thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Haley. Thanks, Sammy. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Sotea. Thank you. Have a good weekend. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.